My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 271 of Legally Clueless. Thank you so much for rocking with this podcast. And this is what you can expect a little later in this episode. So I was trying to avoid the cars because it was a two-way traffic. So I was trying to ride on the roadside because now it is running now without no control at all. And we are at a very high speed. So unfortunately, I hit one of the rocks on my left and the, when, when I hit it now because you know the steering controls the front wheels so the car turned and threw my arm muscle my, my right arm outside so as the when as the vehicle turned now is when the people now realize now we now we have an accident now because now they were screaming so my right arm uh, my right arm now was outside and now the the car the van that I was driving now came and laid on top of it now on the side and it's skidded it is skidded like um like 50 meters when the arm was outside that is jane's pretty inspiring story that i really can't wait for you to listen to but first if you are an og member thank you so much for rocking with the podcast and if you're new to the pod audio episodes like this got every single monday Ooh, but we have something new <laughs> just kind of remembered so the midweek tease, which is a nice little episode to carry you through the week, is something we just introduced last week and is going to be out every single Wednesday. And it was birth because I know we've often been told that we need two or three episodes a week, which is hectic. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to commit to something that I'm not going to do and then I let you down, all right? So to keep you going, we'll have a midweek teaser and it allows me to talk to you a little more on some of the thoughts I'm navigating or things I'm going through in my living and my healing and my learning. And this week's teaser will have everything to do with alcohol because I have some thoughts. (laughs) I have some strong as thoughts. However, Back to this episode, before we jump into James's super inspiring story, we have less than 10 spots left to our wellness talk this Saturday. And in case you're just like, wait, what, wait, what, I was waiting to get my ticket, you need to get your ticket ASAP. In case you don't know, on the 25th of May, we have a resident therapist here at Legally Clueless Africa, who also happens to be one of my therapists. And I say that with no shame, by the way, because... (laughs) There's a point life got thick and I had to have two therapists. Anywho, she saw me out of a very dark place through 2022 into 20... Yeah, May through 2022, I think. I think that was the... I'm not sure. And I roped her into our Legally Clueless stuff because I want her to do for you what she did for me in terms of helping me unlearn trauma understand the things that are still sitting with me because of different spaces that I've been in. And one of the things she helped me navigate was the effects of working at a toxic workplace and what that did for my anxiety, my sense of worth, what fears I was experiencing after that, and just so much more. And so that's why this wellness talk that's coming up on Saturday The theme is navigating a toxic workplace. And there's so many people going through this, which is so unfortunate. Like, (sighs) I wish the leaders in organizations would also come for the wellness talk so that they can truly understand just how destructive an unhealthy work environment is to people. You know what I mean? And maybe even just remind them to start seeing their employees, their workers as humans just as fucking humans. You know what I mean? Oh my goodness. So yeah, those are some of the things that we're going to be unpacking at our wellness talk. It's going to be led by Faith, our therapist. She's looking at the definition of toxic workplaces. What are some of the personalities you'll find in these workplaces? What are some tips for you to navigate the spaces in case you're not able to leave just yet? And on that note, I actually was even reading online how a lot of our mental health issues are tied to how much money we have or make, right? Just because we're really living in a shitty capitalist time. And so sometimes if you have the bandwidth, you are advised to 
stay at a toxic workplace as you navigate your next so that you don't add more hecticness, <laughs> for lack of a better word, word, to your mental health issues. Because if you just abruptly quit, then you may not have an income which will make your thoughts or where you are in terms of your mind much worse. There is that. And that's why I said if you have the bandwidth. Because sometimes when you look at the situation, the toxic workplace can be killing you to the point that if you don't leave, we are going to lose you as a person. And in that situation, please get out. And so in that situation, Faith is also going to talk to us about, you know, the fears that come with leaving a job. Trust me, it took me four years. <laughs> four fucking years. And now that I'm on the other side, I'm just like, hey, Jehovah, Del, what were you waiting for? What were you waiting for? But anyway, I give myself grace. It was so scary. It was mm -hmm some of the darkest times in my life and it's when you're in that space no no one can really understand what you're saying you know I think sometimes I used to talk to my community back then and bless them they would try to understand but they because they're not there with you they can't fully grasp it and then also the effects of a negative or a toxic workplace are so they're not physical well in the event that the abuse is not physical it's a mind fuck because it's not like you're being punched or like, so you're feeling these things, but you, you're second guessing the abuse, but your body is still reacting to it. Oh my goodness, that bit was just ridiculous. Anyway, I'm just remembering <laughs> my dark days. Thank God we made it to the lights. Oh my goodness. And I really want this for you as well, because the other side is really beautiful. I am here living proof. And so it's on the 25th of May, which is a Saturday from 10 a.m. We've made our wellness talks virtual so that anyone and everyone can join in. We are on a mission to make wellness spaces, resources accessible to all Africans. So wherever you are, jump in. We also try and minimize the cost. So tickets are a thousand bob. Again, we want to make it accessible to you. So if you check out the show notes, there is a link for you to grab your ticket. If you go to LegallyCluelessAfrica.com, you can also get our tickets there. You can also get your tickets there or you can grab them on Hassel Sasa. And one other thing that I will share is you will be able to ask faith questions even anonymously. Just in case you're feeling scared like what if another workmate is on the call with me, etc. You'll be able to ask the questions anonymously should you feel the need to do that. Okay, so that is one. Number two is the story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump into this super inspiring story by James. Can I just share that this was the first time I was listening to this story. Our correspondent sent it in. It was the first time I got to a point in the story where I had to breathe. I don't know if that makes sense. I just, like I wanted to give James a big hug. This was the first time that's ever happened to me. Over 200 and 70 episodes in. This was the first time. Anyway, listen to his story and then let's chit chat about it afterwards. A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. My name is James Kimani. I'm a born again Christian. I thank God. I come from a background of, uh, from a family of, actually we were saved and then our last born passed on. Before I was born, we also lost another James that before me. So now we are remaining with five. And uh, I was born and raised in Kahawa, Kahawa Barracks actually. Then we lived in Kahawa and Dani. My father was a soldier back then. All our adventures we did, and uh, not just in the barracks, but outside this place called Kahawa and Dani. All the way to Kawaskari is the place where we used to go for adventures. I enjoyed my childhood. We really did some very, very natural adventures, like hunting. We used to go hunting with dogs, and uh, all the Kawaskari was a ranch, and we used to have nice hunting dogs, and we could eat game meat. You could imagine, sometimes we could come and then uh, some elderly people could just take the meat from us and give us something small because we were young boys. We also enjoyed making cars. We had passion for cars. We used to make cars with wires. And there are some of us the, who they were gifted in that. Uh, we used to take them wire. They, they, they make a very nice matter too, we can imagine. And sometimes we used to take tins 
and we really enjoyed cars. I really didn't have the time to grow up with my siblings properly because my sister that I'm that I'm to follow, there's a 14 year difference. So you can imagine now, so we didn't grow up together. My mom was a civil servant. She used to work in Joko House, Minister of Education. And then she retired. She went to central part of Kenya to become a banana farmer. And so when I, I so I school there, my elementary school, and then my high school, I went to Eastern, a school called Nunguni High School. After that, form two, I came to a school in Thika called Equita High School. I used to call it School of Hard Knocks. After that, so I wanted to join the college I wanted to do some food production. I always had you know, also passion for cooking and all that. But in the meantime, as I was waiting for my intake in August, my sister now relocated from Germany. They came to settle in the coastal part of Kenya, Mombasa. They requested if I could go there. They wanted to start a transport business. They wanted to go there, me to go there and manage. So I decided to take the offer and it said now to move and go to Mombasa. So that is another whole new journey that began. Mombasa is another place altogether. So I gained a lot of experience in the transport business. I really had passion now for they were doing matatus. So for for the matatu to be to be competitive, you really had to apply so many things. Graffiti, music and all that used to also good drivers, the one that can really drive very fast because it's about making money. So the competition was stiff and I really loved that. And then uh, after that, now the business did not go. They, their company, it, they did not end up well. So they had difference and that. So they decided to close. And so I had to look for other options. And I said, now I'm not just going to, to be in the transport business. I think let me look for a decent job. That is where I got to join um, a cab company. There's a cab called Kencam. I went to Kencam. I went to Smart Cabs. I went to Universal Cabs because actually the Lord helped me to, to have a parking. In Mombasa, when you have a parking as a driver, I used to have a parking, there's a, a hotel called Royal Castle Hotel. So I benefited to have a, a parking. So it, it was easier for me to go to any company and say, hey, how are you guys, you, 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 I know you have a company, but I'm, I'm sure you don't have a parking. So I'm a driver who wants a parking. So I was given a job very fast. So I advanced again from there. I joined tours and travel. So you find the, the, the Swiss tourist and the German tourist, they really made us really appreciate whatever we were doing. And so many other tourists, they came. And so it became a portion for me. So I really want now, when I, 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 I saw that, because I really wanted to explore, I was young, and I saw that uh, the, this is an opportunity before I clocked 30, I thought that I could go beyond this. So a friend of mine gave me a link. There were some jobs that were, were being hired in the overseas. He thought that I could apply because I really loved driving. Driving, driving was a passion. I was among the, uh, the first people that were privileged to do defensive driving. And so I, was, I could do 120 and you, you're sleeping, comfortably you're sleeping. When I hit a bump, you cannot know whether I've hit a bump. So I had to apply for the job. So I had to come to a room before some, um, after applying, they told me I have to come for medical. And so I thought of how now I could leave Mombasa because now I've stayed there for, for over 10 years, 10, 11 years. And I saw that I needed, I needed a break. I said, hey, I'm born in Nairobi, raised in Nairobi, but I've never got a chance to work in Nairobi. I think it's the high time maybe I go. And also my mother wanted also me to come home because we, we, we didn't spend time together after finishing school, high school. I just went for 10 years. He didn't want to say what kind of a man am I becoming. So I had to come. I had to come. I had to leave everything. I found some friends of mine. They had, um, they, they, there's a circle called the Manchester, Manchester Travelers. It was so new. So they had very nice cars. And I got an opportunity to have one of them and say, would you mind? They said, no, you know, driving was my passion. So I, I had an opportunity to, to, to have one of those new, uh, they were so nice. You know, driving you enjoy. I'll tell you, you enjoy them. The first thing you do, you know, they don't have the speed governors. Even if they had for the Manchester, the first thing you're given because you love driving, you cannot operate with a, with a speed governor. I think it's very hard when you break the rules. You, you, you also suffer the consequences because we used to go from town to thicker 30 minutes, 30 minutes at most. So we used to fly and because the car was nice and good music and all that. And uh, we used to really, I used to really enjoy that. So in the meantime, as I was, I was doing that, I was also making some cash because I also did the money for, 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 for traveling as well and here and there. But I was doing as a passion. So I had filled all my documents. I secured a good job. And the job that I was going also in the, in the overseas in Dubai was a, was a driving job, actually. I, I was to be a limousine driver. And I was being paid so well. And I, I was to live in a seven-star hotel, the same hotel. And so the contract was so good. So I was just getting ready. But now little did I know 
that whatever was awaiting for me now. Because the same driving job that I loved so much. I used to be a very fast driver. I was not careless, but I was very fast. As I was getting ready, as I was really preparing now to go, I remember now, I was not even now in Manchester. A friend of mine now requested me because, like I said, when you when you are a doctor, your friends are doctors. When you are a lawyer, most of the friends are lawyers. Yeah, your contemporaries and all that. So in my case now, so many of my friends were drivers from different routes. Now this driver was was dri driving a car from a different circle, from Nairobi to Embu. The circle was called Kukena Circle. So he requested me that on, on a Sunday, I remember, it was on 28th September 2014. He requested me that um, because he knew I had the legal documents. Uh, yes, I had the documents. He requested me whether I could uh, I could afford now to, to have his count that day. Because there were some women that had requested to be ferried from from one point. There's a place in the central Kenya called uh, Igekero. They wanted to be taken from Igekero to a place called Kabati. So they say, because to tomorrow I have a private, would you mind coming over, pick my car? I will send my conductor and uh, you can just work together. You, you pick these women, they're church women. You take them from, from Igekero to Kabati and then... Uh, you do a few trips and then in the evening we go back for them i said yes because on that sunday i was not actually working little did i know now that was to be my fateful day because when i went the women were there they prayed we we took them and then we dropped them and they said that you are you guys you you come back for us at around four four or five we'll give you a call and so the conductor said ah we still have a long day so you could do some few trips together i say why not ah and the way i love driving so we did embu embu thika embu thika embu thika embu thika but they did like four to five trips four to five trips yes i remember the fifth trip when they were calling we were coming from Embu, and they said they'd give me 45 minutes i'll be there so we took people very fast to thika and then we came back now for them all this time that i was driving the car didn't have any issues but uh, when we picked them, uh, they were not late, they were not angry. As we were going back, it was about 6 p.m. now. It was about some minutes to 6, yes. Now as we are going back now to, to the destination where I had picked them from, a place called Igikero in the central part, yeah. So there's a place called Sabasaba. Sabasaba is a, is a steep area. There is a, there is a market called Sabasaba, but the, the, the town is on a hill. So as we are coming there, I remember I, I accelerated very fast because it, it was an uphill and then downhill. When I came now, it, it, it was a two-way traffic. When I came now, after finishing the hill now, going down the hill is when I realized now, when I tried to pump on the brakes, I realized that the brakes were not there. Actually, the brakes failed when I was at a speed. And remember, it was so unfortunate because I was trying to imagine. Here at the driver's seat, I had... Um, I had a woman that was having a, an infant. And when I talk about an infant, is a, a baby less than three months that was breastfeeding. And then beside her, there were two girls, age 11 and 12. They were just there, helplessly. So when the car lost brakes, I was thinking so many things were going in my mind because we were at a speed and uh, the car had an excess of 19 women. So I was thinking, Nobody knows whether, uh, whether whether the car has brakes or not. They are just laughing. They are just enjoying. And I think they had a good service wherever they are. They were. And now here I am. We are we're running at a speed. And the car has failed brakes. So we're just saying a silent prayer. Say, oh Lord, have mercy upon us. We will not die. With a fraction of a second. So I was trying to avoid anything that I can hit because of the infant. Because I had an option. In front of me, there, there was a Nissan that I was standing beside. And uh, there were actually two Nissans. So I had an option of hitting one of them at the back to make the to reduce the motion of the, of the vehicle. But again, I thought very fast. I say, if I hit this car from behind, the infant and the little children, because you know the Nissan does not have a, a bonnet. And so the impact is so direct. So I could have just, I think I could have just thrown them out of the windscreen. So I opted not to use that way. So I was trying to avoid the cars because it was a two-way traffic. So I was trying to ride on the roadside because now it is ro running now without no control at all and we are at a very high speed. So unfortunately, I hit one of the rocks on my left and the, when, when I hit it now, because you know the steering controls, the front wheels. So the car turned and threw my arm outside, my, my right arm outside. So as the, when, as the vehicle turned now, is when the people now realize that we now we have an accident now because now they were screaming. So my right arm, uh, 
my right arm now was outside and now the the car the van that i was driving now came and laid on top of it now on the side and it skidded it is skidded like um like 50 meters when the arm was outside and then it stopped so when it stopped there was there was a lot of yelling i was still sober i had not lost my conscious so people came they were trying to rescue us breaking all the windows moving people out and then i was the last person they when they were saying the driver is still there they were telling me come out come out he said no i cannot he, the, the, the car you have to get out the car fast so they call the the, the 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 motorbike guys they came they tried to pull down the van to pull up the van so when they pulled it i was there now helpless but thank god because my legs were okay my head was okay my chest was okay my spine was okay but something was not okay my right arm had come out had come off the body now so i saw two things i saw my phone and i saw my arm literally it was and now I could not feel pain because now the pain had exceeded now I was numb what was coming out I was oozing blood I was oozing a lot of blood and when I, I couldn't believe is this my arm that I'm seeing yes it is out it is completely so I picked it up with my left now I don't have a right arm with with my left arm and now I I thought that I could take it to the hospital and uh, they could just like fix it back so every time i went when when i picked that arm and i was going to the mo- the motor the motorbike guys all of them just could just run away nobody was standing there others were recording maybe their phones i was really feeling bad people from the top of the buildings they were just removing their phones and recording me helplessly and i remember i was just asking them is there anybody who can help me surely what will it benefit you when you are recording me will you benefit what will it benefit you when i die why can't you just help me i began to suffer again in pain i see these people they are so merciless they cannot even help someone they are busy recording and so i decided now to lie down when i decided to lie down i was asking god questions why why are you doing this to me i've only have two weeks to travel why why are you doing this to me lord why do i really deserve this and then as i was asking myself those questions i i had a hoot somebody hooting I think he thought maybe I was a drunkard or something. So when I went to check out, I found that it was an old man. It was an old man who was voting. He was voting. He wanted me to he wanted me to to I think move out of the way. Maybe he thought I was drunk. He couldn't see that I don't have a name. So I woke up. Something told me just wake up. Go to that car. Is when I came to realize it was not just something that was God speaking to me. So I picked my arm, went straight to the car, and when I went straight to the car, the man could not believe what he's seeing because I'm coming, holding my right arm with my left arm now. He could not believe what he's seeing. So his mouth was going from small to wide, his eyes big, and then fortunately he had not locked the 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 door behind. So I went to his car, I put my arm uh, between my legs and opened with my left arm, and it opened. and i got in when i got in uh he had his wife the wife started screaming 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 and saying why have you carried this man this man will die in this car what have you brought to yourself why i say mama i'm not dying i'm not dying relax i'm not dying in fact uh, let me give you a number you call my, my my mother so that you inform her that i've got an accident and we are going to a certain hospital there's a hospital called kennel hospital we are driving there so same say please let's hurry let's hurry so he didn't have any other option the lady said i i gave her number she called my mother so as we drove to the hospital i was really losing a lot of blood i started now feeling now a lot of thirst i could tell them do you have water they only had sodas but i couldn't mind so i drank every soda every liquid thing that was in that car i drank but still i was feeling thirsty so when we reached the hospital i thought now that i could die i saw it now i saw death in the eye in my eyes when i reached the hospital the man entered with the we hooting and hooting say we have an emergency we have an emergency so i'm the same the same person i opened up the door with my left arm and took my right arm so when i came out of the door there were some two nurses i think they were taking maybe maybe some maybe food or i don't know what they were carrying but once they saw me they saw a man carrying a hand an arm with other arm they ran very fast 
they dropped everything and they say if the doctors can run away i said loudly then lord i've accepted now to die before i could give up another lady another nurse now appeared to me i say no because she heard me say now i'm ready to die she said no you're not going to die you will leave say you will leave i say why are they running i say let them run but here i am here i am you are not dying today you're not dying today she really encouraged me i said are you sure she said no you're not dying she called out for help stretchers came she put me in a stretcher she took me to another room without even taking out my trousers or something she was giving me injection i, I later came to understand they were diclofenas painkillers they uh, she jabbed they took a lot of jabs for the pain for the pain and then i was telling them give me water give me water they say no we cannot give you water if you give you water is dangerous you might die i say no you don't understand give me water so i was contemplating to he i wanted to now to piece on my swan on my shoe and then i drink my urine because no one could understand me I say you are not understanding I am burning with thirst I need water they say no instead of giving you water let us use insulin with we'll water in your body so I say okay, hurry up hurry up as they were planning to do so ah I, I jumped over the bed took all over the insulin tear it with my mouth and took it literally I, it was so salty I remember the doctor said look at this one you might die I say let me die so i took it i took one bottle i told them give me another one they told me i say give him just give him because he has chosen but i did not die i took two bottles i felt better and then they had called now for the surgeon i signed a consent i went to the theater but now they could not replace the arm they could not replace the arm unfortunately so i was referred also to another bigger hospital i went to Baragua hospital i stayed there for a month is when i realized now the traffic commandant of the place where i had uh, where I did accident came to visit me in the hospital i said who's james kimani and i thought i was in a, i was in trouble because these are policemen a lot of policemen came and he brought me my phone remember i had left my phone at the accident uh, scene so he brought my phone back and he said young man you have really amazed us we have not seen something like this you you you, you did not kill anybody nobody died you did not hit any car you do not hit any motorcycle he brought me some fruits and he told me ah, here's my number when you get out of the hospital please come and i will see what i can do for you though i did not go but he was a good man so when i opened up my phone i saw a lot of missed calls because my journey was two weeks i was to travel and the agent that was taking me was calling and saying do you know your flight is on tuesday hey your flight is on tuesday and now this is friday now how do you explain to him that i don't have an arm and he saw me just the other day that i got an accident so it was not easy for me but the good thing is all that time i was in hospital the women that i had ferried they used to come to the hospital every day every single day for almost one and a half months i accepted myself but again i could not accept the fact that now i cannot do anything on my own anymore now i was i was a passionate driver I was an executive chauffeur. I was all that. I was going to a driving job. Now I thought that I had lost everything because now I was so angry. I was so angry with myself. Why did I take that count that day? I was so angry with God. Why did he allow me? Surely, why is he punishing me like this? I was so angry with my friends because 90, 90% of them deserted me completely because they, they, they saw I could not be of any benefit again. I don't know. But the world changed. The whole thing turned around. The world became a dark place for me. Now the only place that I was left for refuge now is my mother. And they said now um, even my siblings, they really struggled because uh, I think everybody was asking themselves questions. Why? So I didn't have any other option. I had just go, to, go back to my mother's place, try to find out now what am i going to do next remember now i don't have a single arm so i cannot wash anything for myself so there were some good neighbors who are coming they were helping me with laundry here and there and now uh, but my mother was busy comforting saying it's going to be well don't worry my son but, but i was asking how how is it really going to be well now become disabled now will i be begging will i be able to do anything for myself again how will i even start why I was asking her, why, mom? Why all this? Why this time? What is happening? I, 
I was in with a lot of pain and a lot of so many questions. So, but I thank God because um, as I was still there, I, I was raised in church, so I, I never failed to go to church. And the church that I was now going to attending, um, there was a redeemed gospel church around it, but it was not it was not near because I used to go like for for three for three three kilometers I walk. So as I go there, I found the youth. Because I was now I was still a youth, I thought that I could mentor the youth. So I was like, I became a youth patron. So I was just mentoring them to go into the right ways and all that. And I saw that that would now give me healing. At least now, when I saw that, at least I could help people. That one gave me some form of healing. I thought I was a useless man. I said, oh, so after all, I'm not that bad. Because they could listen to me, I could guide them. So until where now, now the Lord sent some people from the city to come all the way and look for me. I say, we have been sent by the Lord to come and ask you to come to Nairobi. I say, who are you? We are servants of God. I say, no, I, no, 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 no. I cannot go to with people I don't know. I say, please, the Lord has requested us to come. We'll pay for your house. We know your condition. We will pay for, we'll, 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 we'll cater for your needs in the meantime. Please come. I said, no. The Lord asked me to speak. No, 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 no. I refused because I didn't know the intentions. And the Lord had not spoke to me about anything. So, but they kept on insisting and persisting and persisting and persisting. Until finally, my mother told me, you just go, you are a baby, you, you are a grown-up. When you see that is, the environment is not conducive, just go. Just go. Just honor the invite. If you see all this not working, please come back. The door is wide open. Eventually, I came. So, when I came to Nairobi, I found them. They had a church. I stayed with them for a little while. They asked me if I could do business. I said, yes, what kind of business? So, I became um, a vendor. I started selling tomatoes at a certain point so people could come because now I cannot I cannot package them so you do everything for yourself. I give you the paper, you you take the tomatoes, you put, you give me the money. And I saw it was, uh, but because they were perishable goods, when it reaches Sunday, I carry the rest to church and people are forced to buy. So we have to support James, we have to support James. But it did went far. The bishop told me now, this is not the reason why I called you. You did not come here to become a businessman. I say, what do you mean? I said, the Lord told me that you are a preacher. I say, me? Preaching? Uh-uh. I said, no, I cannot be a preacher. You'll be a preacher. Me? No, no, no. no. I cannot be a preacher. I, could, I would just be a, a faithful congregant. Um, I cannot preach. I've never seen myself preach. I say, no. The Lord showed me that you are a preacher. Oh, I denied and I declared. In fact, I disagreed with him completely. I say, I'm giving you some time to think. I'll give you three days. You should go for prayers. I said, okay. But I did not go for prayers. I continue with my life. I say from next week, you are not selling those tomatoes again. I'm very serious. He drew a line and he changed. And I never seen his face like that. And he said, now you will take your bag, take your Bible. He gave me, uh, there were like five evangelists in that church. He chose for me one of the evangelists. Say you'll be going with him and see what he does. That is what you're supposed to do. Carry your bag and your Bible. So I used to follow. So I obeyed at least. So I followed him. He could preach in the bus. I, again, he could do, when we come to town, he could go to the malls, go to garages, he preaches, he shares the word, just like that. So I went with him for over a week. I said, surely, Lord, this is what you want me to do. Then I said, one day, I will know if you, this is what you want me to do. So one day I decided to do that by myself without his help. So I stood and I made sure I, I stopped the matter to which I wanted it to decline. It's a place called Comarok. They have these well, uh, well graphic matatus with very loud music. I made sure because I wanted the driver to say no. So that I have the reason to f- going back home and say, you see now, Lord, they don't want me to preach. So I stopped one of them. And to my surprise, I asked the driver, uh, can I preach in this matatu? They say, why not? Come. I say, you did not hear me properly. I want to preach. He say, yes, we, we, we need preaching. <laughs> it was something that was unheard of. I preached a Komarok mat. I preached to town. And then I say, is there anybody who would like to bless the work of the Lord? People were so willing. They really blessed me. Ah. And then I heard the voice telling me, go to Thika, Kenyampia. Kenyampia, where there were new buses called Kenyampia in Nairobi. So I went there. Amazingly, there were no preachers by then. So I went to the office, talked myself out to say, can I be preaching in this bus? I said, yes, why not? We listen to your preaching. But again, I was preaching and I was not asking for offering because the Lord had told me don't ask people asking for offering. I will instruct men to bless you. So I used to preach and sit down and the people could follow me. Where is you? Where is this church? Where is this church? People could come to that church. I attracted a lot of so many people. 
Ah, and I became the head of the pastors. In that church, I had found five pastors. The, the, this church was a, it still is a Pentecostal church. Now, uh, the, this church is built on uh, evangelists. Evangelists that are uh, evangelists, you know, in the fivefold ministry, they say that apostles, they govern. The prophets, they guide. The evangelists, they gather. The pastors, they guard. The teachers, they ground. So the evangelists gather. Evangelists go there. They, they go and gather. So the, they, the church had five evangelists that were going out, fishers of men, like what Jesus did. So when I came, when I joined the group, I became the sixth man. So when I became the sixth man, I became so effective, more than all of them five, because people used to follow me a lot. And our bishop made me now the second in command of all of them. And I was privileged. I came with a lot of favor. So until now, that, that is when there was a day, you know, I, I used to wake up at six. I go pray to church for two hours, and then I go share the word. One day as I was preaching, I met a, I, I, I met a boss from somewhere who owns a media station. I say, would you like to preach on, on TP? I say, yes, but I don't know how. I say, have my number. I ask you, do I have to pay anything? I say, no, you don't have to pay anything. You just come. That, that is how when I went there to that media station, they started following me up. I say, how do you dress up? Because you can see you have one hand. How do you take breakfast? How do you live? How do you cope? And they, they did a documentary for me. It's so amazing. One thing... Um, that led me because when I came to discover that the Lord wants me to do this, the Lord appeared to me in a, a very audible voice and said, ah, James, I've seen your heart. I've seen what kind of a person you are. Now go, I will send for you. You will do my work and I will do your work. No other work, but do my work and do your work. That is how I knew that the Lord now has really called me now into his vineyard and he gave me a passion of reading the word of God a lot and I understood it more than any other time and so it, it became my cup of tea now I used to wake up and I go for evangelism and all that so I didn't know that the transition of being stopped and having got an accident was coming to transform into being somebody else again I didn't know that the Lord was planning for me to transform from being a driver just a mere driver or an executive chauffeur to become and become also a pastor in his calling and his in vineyard I didn't know that many are the plants in a man's heart, but it's only the Lord purpose that prevails. So I came to understand that when God says that our thoughts are not like his thoughts, sometimes we plan like this, but also he has a, a different plans altogether. And also came to understand, so each one of us, we, have, we, we are given an assignment for the short period that we are in this year up. There is a certain and specific assignment that we are given. I thought my assi assignment was becoming a driver, but I, but I was so wrong, I was so wrong. God had other intentions as well. So despite for me having passion of driving, I can still drive. I can still drive with one now because the driving, you know, I have more than 16 years, let's say 18 years of driving experience. So the driving is in the head automatically. But one thing is for sure, little did I ever came to understand that uh, I was being called into the ministry and the process that the Lord used because I thought I was a very useless man. I thought it was the end of the road for me. I thought it was the end of the road for me. Number one, do you know every time even even if I take a matatu or, or somebody's giving me a lift and is really driving very fast, hmm, I, normally, I normally say in my heart, this one has never found anything strange. I'm telling you, it's good to be cautious. It's good to be cautious. I, I always have that phobia because you might be driving, you can be trusting the car but that's a machine. Anything can happen at any time. Anything can happen. So the, the feeling of me driving, I cannot drive like I used to drive again. I drive cautiously. And before even I drive, I have to make sure the vehicle, I don't walk on ignorance again. You remember this car that I got an accident with? It is a car that belonged to my friend. I, I knew nothing about this car. I never knew that the, the days of the service had passed on. Yes, because the brake pad had failed. Yeah, I didn't have brakes. Uh, it is the brakes that failed. But also now, looking on the other side, that was a careless mistake. But again, I thank God because he turned that into good, into another way. But suppose I died. Suppose something wow has happened. It could be the negligence. Even, even, even today, there, there, are some, there are some driving that, there are some people who really behave crazily on the road. I tell myself, they have never seen, they have never, they have never seen. Because once beaten, you become twice shy. You become twice shy. So the feeling that I get every time I go, I have to make sure, is this car okay? 
yeah even as i'm driving i make sure and uh, i i drive cautiously cautiously yes i drive cautiously although now i'm trusting god now now to bless me now with my own car eh, i am really praying god to that mm, i'm really trusting god and saying now god now give me now my own because at least now you know you have enabled me to drive. My word of, of, of advice to every driver, the matatus, because, okay, I was a matatu and I was a very fast driver. It's good to understand that, number one, you are not insured. You are not insured. You know, even me, I was not paid by insurance. No. They, they cover everybody else, but the driver is not insured. I would wish that they would take a personal cover, number one, just because... If my family had not come through, I'm telling you, I paid a lot of money. I paid a lot of money. And uh, if my family had not come through, do you know the bacteria that was in my body? I was taking a medicine that was costing me 10,000 shillings per day. Per day. So it's not easy. And sometimes in t t times like that is when you, 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 you don't see any of your friends. So if you don't have a personal cover, please be cautious. Know that people are depending on you. You are very important. Don't be reckless. In case of anything, if anything happens, you know choices have consequences. It is good to be safe than sorry. That is a machine. Don't trust it so much. And make sure you service your car properly. Make sure the brake pad are okay. Because accident happens in seconds. With a blink of an eye, something else goes wrong somewhere. Ah. I'm telling you now, you, you, had a very, you hear a very loud bang. So it's always good to ensure your car are properly serviced. And I will advise them also to take a personal car. And also, it's good to understand in their mind that there are people depending on them. Because they have families. You know, sometimes people live very careless life as, as if no one cares. No. You might be a driver, yes. But again, you are a parent. You're also a brother. And you're also a son who belongs to somebody. Yeah, you, you are also a taxpayer somewhere. Yeah, you are also a customer somewhere. You are a valuable person. For the sake of tomorrow, it's good to be safe than sorry. And ignorance is very expensive. Sometimes arrogance does not pay. Because sometimes you see a lot of arrogance in the road. Somebody is driving it. You, you wonder, surely, is this person... You see, and you won't go far. You won't go far. It's good to be safe than sorry. It's good to be cautious on the road. Always. People have lost their legs, people have lost their eyes, people have lost their limbs just because of accident, because somebody somewhere drove carelessly. So I would urge them, at least be cautious, always. Know that people, the people you are carrying, they also have destinies. They also have people to depend on. There is a bright future ahead. Everybody is hopeful. If you don't love yourself, love others. But there is no way you can love others if you don't love yourself. First of all, love yourself. It's good to be safe. I'm sorry. Catch more African stories in the next episode of Legally Clueless. That is James's super powerful story. I mean, when he was describing the accident, my goodness, I just I had to take a breather. You know, I was imagining the type of pain and confusion he was going through, and then to add insult to injury. Everybody around him is recording instead of helping. The weird fucking thing about smartphones is they were designed to connect us. The internet was designed to connect us. But what happens? We allow it to dehumanize us. We allow it to create more rifts between us. Because I cannot imagine that when someone has an accident, your first thought is to record it as the injured person is crying out for help. Do you know how unhinged that is? So damn unhinged. And then on top of that, like I don't blame the good Samaritan's wife who took him to hospital. Like I want to have grace for her, but that's another thing, right? Like the effects of the world we live in is that we're so fearful of each other that we will not help. And I know like, I can't remember when I had this conversation, I think when I was hosting a radio show and people would say they're scared of carrying survivors of accidents in their cars to hospital because if they die in your car, you get inconvenienced or you have a, you know, a lot to now go to the police station, etc. And I just, maybe it's because I haven't been in that situation, but I just kept thinking, yeah, but someone has been severely injured. You know what I mean? Like, how am I thinking about 
myself first in that situation. Maybe this is naive of me because I've not been in that situation. Again, I know Kenyan cops don't have the best rep, but yeah, I just, I still remember back then being like, I don't understand this. I don't get this at all. Another thing this story reminded me of is like one of my biggest fears, because I drive alone a lot and I'd always had this fear of getting into an accident and the first responders wanting to rob me first before helping me. It's still a fear I have. And I'm just always like, I don't have a solution for that situation other than hoping this person will have some humanity. I think the last thing that really stuck with me from this story is just the grace, the grace that he has to be able to fight for a better day, fight for a better mindset, kind of lean into his religion or his beliefs, his spirituality, etc., to kind of get that extra strength. Sometimes when I hear what people rise from, it's always a reminder of like how powerful we can be as humans if we kind of adopt the right mindset. And I think this is one of those stories that reminds me of that. But I do want to hear your thoughts on James's story. So whatever platform you're listening to this on, please drop a comment. And sometimes we share your comments on our Instagram page just to, you know, send you some love. Remember, if you want to share your story on this podcast, all you have to do is fill out the storyteller form. There is a link to it in the show notes and one of our correspondents will get back to you. No matter where you are, we want to hear your story. Like the only prerequisite is that you have to be African. Sit too. <laughs> the African. We just want to amplify your story. If you are in East Africa, catch us on Trace Eastern Africa every Monday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. And Fridays with there at 1 p.m., Head over to traceradio.co.ke to stream. <laughs> and oh, I'm very happy about the midweek teaser. That's the note I'm going to leave you on. I'm very happy about it because it allows me a space to talk to you a bit more. And so I'm excited to see how that will grow. This episode, I'm not leaving you with grace. I'm leaving you the big thank you because I'm just kind of reflecting, you know, speaking of toxic workplaces reflecting on where I was beginning of 2019 into March 2019 when I started this podcast I'm thinking of where I was in my mind space then I was so fucking broken and I'm just like look how far I've come and I'm thankful to you for being part of that journey and I want you to go through that change as well in case you are also in a toxic workplace right now so i hope to see you at our wellness talk 25th of may which is a saturday 10 a.m grab your tickets they're linked in the show notes that's it for this episode of legally clueless you can share this podcast with your friends you can keep it for yourself i'm not judging just make sure you're here next week for the next episode